So this is joint work with Jacques-Henri Jourdan and François Potier. So I will start this talk with a puzzle. Suppose that we have a program f from integer to integers. And suppose that it behaves extensionally. It means that when applied to the same inputs, it returns the same outputs. So the question is, is it possible to dynamically check that the program f is a constant function, that it always returns the same output? So unfortunately, no. This is an undecidable question, problem. But what if we change the type of the argument of f from integers to lazy <coughs> integers? Then there is an approximate solution. And the idea is to check whether or not the program f you use its argument, whether or not it calls its argument. If it does not call its argument, it cannot depend on it. So therefore, it must be a constant function. So here, I show you the implementation of the solution in the form of a function is constant. And I go through it step by step. So in the beginning, we allocate a reference r, which is initialized with true. Then we define the lazy integers pi, which returns 0 and also performs the observable effect of changing the state of the reference r to false. Then we execute the, the program f applied to the argument pi, lazy integers pi. And afterwards, we check the state of the reference r. So if r is true, it means that the program f has never called its argument. And therefore, it must be a constant function. The programming technique that we use to implement, implement the solution is what is, we call spine. And we call it, we call it so because the lazy integer spy is disguised as the integer 0, but it does something more. It performs the observable effect of changing the state of the reference r. So now you ask the question, can we verify this code? So before we attack the question, let's Let's stage some motivation to see why this is a relevant question. So there are two reasons why this is a relevant question. The first one is because spying has never been the subject of verification work in separation logic. And the second reason is because spying is related to the design of real-world programs, such as algorithms for computing fixed points. So now that we are motivated to answer this question, for the rest of the talk, I will focus on this example of the function is constant. I will give you the proof sketch. And by the end of the talk, you will have the key ideas to understand the verification of the program is constant. And the same ideas could be applied to the verification of an algorithm for computing fixed points. So let's go to the verification of the, this function is constant. And the first step in the verification of this program is to propose a specification. And the specification that we propose is the one I'm showing you here. And it reads as follows. If the program f implements a mathematical function phi, then after the execution of is constant applied to the program f, it returns a Boolean b, such that if b is true, then phi is a constant function. And the assertion f implements phi captures the idea that the program f behaves as a mathematical function and it's itself defined as a hard triple. The hard triple says that for any lazy integer x that computes an integer m, when f is applied to x, it returns phi of m. And the lazy integer computes an integer m if when applied to unit, it returns m. So there are two remarks I would like to make before we continue. The first one is that all of these hard triples do not mention resources, neither effects. It does not mean that this code is pure. They can use imperfect features, future features, but it has to be hidden. And the second remark is that in the post condition of the function is constant. We do not mention the case where b is false. That's why we, I said that this is a approximate solution. So let's attack the verification of this code. And the first idea that comes to our minds is perhaps to prove the assertion that if r contains true, then phi is a constant function. We will have to prove this assertion at the end of the code anyway, because it's more or less the post condition. And we might wonder whether or not this is an invariant. It has the good property of becoming trivially true when we call spy 
and change the state of R. Because when R is false, the implication becomes trivially true. But the problem is that in the beginning of the execution of the program, the reference R is already initialized with true, and we will only be able to infer that phi is a constant function after the execution of f applied to pi. Therefore, this is not an invariant. The assertion only becomes true after the execution of f applied to pi. So a better candidate for an invariant is one that includes the number of times that pi is called. And I think that everyone will agree that the total amount of times that pi is called during the execution of the function is constant is equal to the number of times it has been called plus the number of times it will be called. And another assertion in the invariant is a reminiscent of the previous one. And it says that if R contains true, then the number of past times it's called is zero. So now we have another problem. How do we count the number of times that spike will be called? And for that, we are going to use what are called prophecy counters. So prophecy counters, first of all, it's ghost code. They do not appear at runtime. And secondly, it was implemented using prophecy variables, which were recently introduced into Iris. So, and before I go into the, each of these operations, I will give you the intuition right away. And the intuition is that if the state of a prophecy counter is the, the natural number n, it means that it will be called n times before it's deallocated. So let's go to the first operation, which is the allocation of prophecy counter. So when we allocate the prophecy counter, it yields a natural number n, which denotes the number of times it will be called before it's deallocated. Now, the, prof the, the prophecy, the operation prophecy decrement makes sense. It is a call to the, the prophecy counter. And after this call, we learn that the number of times it will be called is at least one. It's greater than zero. And the number of times it will be called gets decremented by one, because we just made a call. Also, the deallocation of a prophecy counter makes sense, because when we deallocate, we learn that the number of times it will be called is zero. So I mentioned that this is ghost code. So we have to instrument our code with these three operations. So the idea is that in the beginning of the code, we will learn how many times the prophecy counter will be called. And by placing the prophecy call inside the body of spy, the number of times that the prophecy counter is called matches with the number of times that spy is called. So since the beginning of the execution of the program, we know how many times spy will be called. And it's denoted by the natural number n. Now we can translate the informal invariant that I showed before into a, into a formal one that can be written in iris. And it's easy to see the correspondence between the two. The first line that says that the number of times spy is called is equal to the number of past calls plus the number of future calls gets translated to the state of the prophecy counters L. It will be called L times in the future. And the total number of times pi is called N is equal to the number of past calls K plus L. And the assertion, if R contains true, then the number of past calls is zero, gets translated to the state of the reference is B, such that if B is true, then K is zero. So now, by exploiting this variant, at the end of the code, we infer that if R contains true, then spy has never been called. So the state of the reference R is B, such that if B is true, then N, the number of times spy is called, is zero. So that's good for the invariant. But I have not yet explained how to relate the number of times spy is called if whether or not the phi is a constant function. So the idea is that if spy has never been called, then spy is dead code. We can give it any specification, even a false one. We can say, for example, that it computes an integer m, an arbitrary integer m, even though we know from the implementation that it computes 0. So now, by exploiting the fact that we can say that spy computes an integer m, and the fact that the program f implements the mathematical function phi, we can compose these two specifications to conclude that after the execution of f applied to spy, 
we have phi of m for an arbitrary integer m. So now you can see from this specification, the second specification, that we are nearly there. We, the, we have only now to move the universal quantification from outside the hard triple to inside the post condition. We have to make this movement. And you can see that the post condition basically says that phi is constant. But what justifies this mov movement of universal quantification? And that's what we call a restricted conjunction rule. It is restricted because the post condition, we assume that the post condition is pure. It's, it only talks about mathematical formulas. It does not mention resources. So as the hypothesis, we take a collection of hard triples indexed by x. And as a conclusion, we have one hard triple, triple where the post condition has the universal quantification. So I would like to remark that we proved this inference rule in Iris, and it's yet another use case of proofs variables, but I will not go into detail. So now just recap, to recapitulate the two main steps into the proof sketch of the function is constant, we have seen that at the end of the code, if, if R contains true, then spy has never been called. And we have seen that if spy has never been called, then phi is a constant function. Therefore, we can conclude the post condition that we, of the specification that we have proposed, which says that if R contains true, then phi is a constant function. So yeah, that's the good for the example of is constant. Let's make just a summary of what we have seen so far. So I show you the example, this example of the function is constant, which is a simple example of spine. And we have seen the proof sketch of this, of this spine, and we have seen how prophecy variables can be useful in the proof sketch of spine, of uh, is constant. And we have seen also a restricted format of the conjunction rule. For the rest of the talk, I will ex briefly explain you what is local generic solvers and what are their, their relation with spine. So local generic solvers are the algorithms for computing fixed points that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. So they take as inputs a function eqs and they return a function phi such that eqs of phi is equal to phi. And they are called generic because this function phi is the least to satisfy this equation for, a fun for an order also defined by the user. And they are local because the function does not need to be defined everywhere. It's, it's a partial, partial function which is computed on demand. So a possible signature for a library implementing a local generic solver would be the one shown in this slide. And from its type, we can see that it solves the fixed point equation on the domain of valuations, on the domain of functions from variables to properties. So a simple example for you of usage of this library would be to, for example, to define Fibonacci. And it's easy to see that Fibonacci is the solution for the fixed point equation of EQS on the domain of functions from integers to integers. So finally, I will explain What's the relation between local generic solvers and the spine? So it comes from the intuitive notion of dependencies. We can say that Fibonacci at n depends of Fibonacci at n minus 1 and Fibonacci at n minus 2. And this idea of dependencies is, are used, is used by local generic solvers for efficiency, for doing minimal work. And Dependencies are discovered at runtime by spine. That's where spine comes. So to conclude, I will briefly talk about what is in the paper and what I didn't have time to go into detail. So there are some improvements to the prophecy variable API. We have we show the, the proof of the conjunction rule. There is some discussion about the usage of locks to make the local, uh, local generic solver, which was primarily sequential, into a concurrent one and thread safe. We also explain the specification and proof of modulus, which is the general case of spine. And we also explain the specification and proof of a local generic solver. 
So some of the limitations of these last items, the proof of a leukogeneric silver, is that we only prove partial connectedness. We do not prove that the algorithm terminates. And we also do not exclude the case of deadlocks. So yeah, that's all for today. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Um, do we have any questions for Paolo? John. Thanks, Paolo. Um, uh, to what extent could you imagine the verification effort that you've done um, being automated? Uh, it is done in Iris, so some of the parts are already automated, but it's, it's not trivial reasoning that I think could be easily automated. Any more audience questions? Okay, we have a question on Slido. Someone is asking, someone anonymous is asking, uh, why do the operations on prophecy counters slash variables need to occur in the code rather than just in the proof? Because there are ghost code. I, I mentioned in the beginning that there are ghost code. So they, we have to instrument the code with these operations, even though they do not appear at runtime. So yeah, there, there is a theorem that says that we can erase these operations, but the theorem, the theorem only works for the whole program on the top level. So we kind of pass this burden of applying the theorem for the user. So at the end of, after using these prophecy variables, we do or the ghost codes such as prophecy counters, the user has to erase these operations. So it would, it would be the same case for the for the conjunction rule. So it's for it's the burden it's on the user to erase the the prophecy variables that are introduced in the conclusion of the inference rule. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, you mentioned that uh, you improved the prophecy variable API of virus. I assume this is the work that Rodolf talked yes. about. So can you elaborate on how you improved it? What were the limitations? Yeah, I have a backup slide. So basically, there is this last rule that we add. So uh, just as a disclaimer, this is not a, a great addition to prophecy variables. It's just a, a reworking of the, it's built on top of the prophecy variables API that already exists. So we, we could add this operation that says that the list of future writings to the prophecy variable, it's new. So for example, in the in prophecy counters, this would be the case where we deallocate the prophecy counter. So it's useful to have this operation. And the other addition is that when we allocate a prophecy, a prophecy variable, when we do the new prof operation, the list of writings to this variable can, can, be, can have a type assigned to it. And this type is free for the user to choose. Before, this type would only be val, which is the type of values in the heap length programming language. But now it can be any type as you choose. We have time for one more question. This is your last chance, folks. Any more questions? OK, in that case, I'll ask you one. So you mentioned that your limitations right now is you don't do deadlock freedom and you don't do termination. Are there any plans to look into that or? So yeah, there is a variant in, of the usual hard triple in Iris which guarantees, which guarantees uh, total correctness. So that would be a, a possibility. But the problem is that for the existence of fixed points, we managed to find a nice framework where we don't need too much too much assumptions on the on the function that we find the fixed point. But for termination, there are a lot of, of possible hypotheses that we could assume, and it's difficult to choose one. We do not we do not manage to find a more abstract set of assumptions to mm -hmm. to guarantee termination. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for Paolo. Thank you.